Hi, I'm John Narrell, and welcome to the Mid-Career GPS Podcast. If you're feeling stuck in your career and overwhelmed by what steps to take, I can help you. As an executive and career transition coach, I help my clients prepare, position, and promote who they are and what they do to show up and find a job they love or love the job they have. It's time to start building your mid-career GPS. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So I'm so excited to welcome another guest to my podcast today. But before we begin, I want you to think about one of the most monumental milestones you've had in your life. That moment when you got your driver's license. To me, it was that that moment of freedom that I had as a 17-year-old where I realized that I could get behind the wheel and go wherever I wanted. And one of the best things I love about being in the car is that I've had some of my most memorable and favorite conversations in my life inside of a vehicle, whether it be with my mom, my husband, my dearest friends, whoever they are, there's just been something about the open road and a long drive that makes it conducive to some great conversations. And you probably remember that day when you got your driver's license. Now, when I was in high school, I had a high school junior English teacher who always made a big deal out of someone's birthday, especially when they got their driver's license. And once you got your license, he would walk up to your desk, look you right in the eye and say, watch what you're doing. Remember, you have a license to kill and be careful. We never knew the story behind his message But those words still stay with me today. And honestly, I can't imagine how he would feel with all of the distracted driving going on today. So if you are listening to this podcast and you are driving, do me a favor, hands at 10 and two, put the phone down. You can listen to this podcast, but I guarantee you without question, the conversation you are going to hear today is going to be something really memorable and special. So I want you to meet Jean Humbrecht. Now, she is the principal attorney at Humbrecht Law PLLC and exclusively handles handles criminal and traffic defense cases, primarily in Prince William County, but throughout Northern Virginia. She received her master's in litigation from the George Washington University Law School and her Juris Doctorate from Ave Maria School of Law. She also recently published her first book, More Than a Fine, The True Cost of Speeding in Virginia, which discusses the often unknown consequences of Virginia's speeding ticket convictions. Humbrecht Law is an award-winning firm having received several distinct honors, including top 40, under 40 criminal defense attorneys in Virginia seven years in a row. Super Loyals Lawyers Rising Star in Virginia five years in a row, and Ms. Humbrecht was recognized as one of the top 100 criminal defense attorneys in Virginia in 2018 and one of the 10 best attorneys for exceptional and outstanding client service in 2019. Jean, it is so good to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John. You know, we've, we got to know each other through the Chamber of Commerce and, and we've stayed connected. And one of the reasons why I wanted to invite you onto the podcast today is I love your story. I love how you got where you are. And I know you're going to add a lot of value to anyone who is listening today. So Gene, as we get started, it's one of the questions I like to begin with. Tell us what you wanted to be when you were growing up. Honestly, John, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a lawyer. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) I always wanted to be a lawyer for as long as I can remember. And I always wanted to uh, do criminal law. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be prosecutor or defense attorney, but um, I I really was interested in that. So honestly, since I was five years old, I can't remember wanting to do anything else. That's great. And what was it about law that even as a kid attracted you to that profession and said, that's what I'm going to do when I get older? Well, if you ask my mom, it's because I like to argue, but I disagree. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, it's it's just it was very interesting to me. It was very fast paced. I liked the uh, the excitement, the thinking on your feet. Obviously, when I was a kid, it was more what I saw on television. Um, you know what attracted me to it, but um, I just I just found it very interesting and something that I always wanted to be involved in. And when you were going through school and you were getting your law degree. Was there ever a moment when you questioned whether you were on the right path or not? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we we all hear how difficult law school is, uh, and it's true. That first semester of law school, I remember it was October, and I was talking to my boyfriend at the time. I I I said, "I'm going to quit. I can't do this. It's too hard." I mean, they 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 really give you more work than you possibly can handle. Now. Fast forwarding, you know, 13 years later, I appreciate that because it's made me a, a better person and and I, I think I can I can work much more efficiently. But it was honestly hell. It was just, it was mm-hmm. so hard. It was, you know, demoralizing at times. It was and and I I was a student that got A's and, and B pluses and it was it was it was just hard. Um but I I kept pushing through it. Um one of our not really guidance counselors, but somebody in that sort of department at the law school, um, I'm sure had seen that a lot. So he said, just get through the semester, you know, see how the semester goes and, you know, come back next time. Like, don't quit now. You're halfway through because we'd already had midterms. Um, and so I did. So I stuck it out and, um, and I'm glad that I did. Nice. Um, but it was, it was a really, it was a really rough go, but I guess what it, what it taught me is, and I didn't really think about this until you asked the question. Um, but what you talk about in, in your podcast a lot, um, the last episode that I listened to, you mentioned yet. I haven't, I haven't gotten the job yet instead of just, I haven't gotten the job or I haven't heard a response. I haven't heard a response yet. Um, for me, it was like, I haven't, I haven't gotten the grasp of law school yet. You know, I just needed to keep pushing. Um, and I'm glad that I did. And I think that taught me a valuable lesson because if I left law school, I don't, I don't know what I'd be doing today. Right. And when you are thinking about that kind of specialty and and I'm going to equate this to you could be somebody working in finance and trying to figure out what niche is that even as a former educator I landed at middle school because I liked the age group and I liked the content and you find that kind of place to land with so many different facets in law how were you able to really narrow down and say, this is my specialty and this is where I get to do my best work? Well, I did always want to focus on criminal law, but when you go to law school, you, they do make you take a little bit of everything. Um, and still, even after all of that, I preferred the criminal law, all the classes that had to do with criminal law. Honestly, sorry to all my professors, but the only things that really stick out in my head from law school in terms of actual learning or the evidence classes, criminal procedure, all those types of classes. I, I learned, I learned other things in those classes and the other classes, and I got a lot of experience. And it was, uh, and I made a lot of friends in law school. It was a good group of people. But those were the classes where I, I actually remember everything. And I guess it's good. Um, but you know, when you're in law school, you don't you don't know how things are going to work out. You like, I had no intention of you know starting my own firm. I wanted to work for another firm. Um, but it was the criminal law that I really um, that I really liked in law school. And the Scott Peterson case, actually, which kind of backtracking, um, uh, that was going on. The trial, I think, was going on when I was in college. I remember I was a sophomore in college and I wrote a paper on it in one of my classes. And why that stood out to me, that's when I really knew that I wanted to be a defense attorney, specifically, not prosecution, but defense over prosecution. Um, and you probably remember it was all over the news. It was I in do. California. I live on the East Coast. I went to school on the East Coast. Um, I thought he was unfairly tried in the media because from my perspective, they're putting, and this is me before law school, I mean, they're putting all these things <laughs> out there that like the jury's not even going to know. This is not fair. There's going to be a tainted jury pool. So to me, it was it was about the the process that you know we we all don't think about, but that this country was really founded on, and and everybody's um, you know right constitutional right to a fair trial. And I thought he he was not getting that. So um, and the case is actually on appeal right now, and he might be re- 
retried, um, at least on, on one particular issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was that issue. Um, but that's when I really knew that I wanted to be a defense attorney. Um, when I graduated from law school, I had an opportunity to get a job on Capitol Hill, um, which I did not want. <laughs> um, I, I did not want, but you know, it was decent money and benefits and, you know, security. And I took it and they offered me the job, even pending my bar results. And, and then, you know, once you're in that position, um, as you talked about the golden handcuffs, I think it's, it's hard to leave. I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Um, but then my last two years, I, I worked there from 2010 to 2014. And then from 2012 to 2014, that's when I got my master's in litigation at GW. Those two years flew by because I worked all day, metroed and ran like hell to try to get to school, barely got there in time, got a ridiculously expensive sandwich for dinner at a, at a cafe on the way. Um, and then, you know, when I when I was coming upon graduation from the master's program, I, I just decided I'd had it. And that's when I decided to leave the Hill and started with a small criminal defense firm in Fairfax and then eventually started my own. I love how you just kind of painted that whole picture for us and, and that kind of progression, right? Because the, the question that is often asked by everybody at mid-career at some point is what's next and exploring and figuring out what you are willing to take on and what you are not, whether you have the golden handcuffs or you are looking for them in some kind of way, right? It's that, it's that moment of really figuring out what is next. And obviously one of the allures at mid-career could be, well, what if I was my own boss? What if I did go this entrepreneurial route? And this is something you and I have talked about previously as well. But for you, what's been the most satisfying thing about owning your own firm and being this entrepreneur in, in your stage of career right now? The most satisfying thing about owning my own firm and being my own boss is being my own boss. Mm. I have, I, I, I call the shots. I can, I can do what I want. I have the flexibility where if I want to go to the gym at noon and run some errands, I can do that. But then when I get back home later, I might work till 10 o'clock at night. You know, sure. my being in control of my schedule, not having to report to somebody. And I don't, I don't want to I don't want to say that in in a bad way. It's it's just this freedom that you don't really appreciate until you have your own firm or your own business, I should say. And in the beginning, it's really rough because most people who start out don't have money. <laughs> it takes a while to get money and, and to get clients. But even then, um, and, and it was also that I was doing what I love to do. And the legal community, the criminal defense bar, people people think that it's really competitive but it's not. Everybody everybody helps each other out. And I got so much help when I first started. I wouldn't be where I was today without the help from other people and other lawyers in the hallway and, and friendships I developed because everybody wants the, the person charged to have the best representation. They want the person to get the good outcome. They don't, they don't want somebody to get railroaded by the system. So everybody helps each other out. So I was lucky in that respect, but um, it, it is difficult when you start, but but definitely the freedom. And I would never go back to working for somebody else. I have the potential potential uh, to make as much um, or as little as I want. If I want to take a vacation for two weeks in June and hopefully go to the beach, I can do that. Now, I'm, I got to have systems set in place so that I don't lose too many clients, but I don't have to ask for permission. I can do those things. I can, if I, if I need time to myself, if I need to do something, then I can do that. Um, so that's, that's really the part that I like the most. I can definitely agree with you on that. There is, there is that kind of freedom that's there. I mean, there's also the pressure, as you mentioned about okay. where is the next client and how do I not make sure I'm not not gone for too long, that I'm not top of mind with certain people and things like that. And so there, there are all mm -hmm. of these different things to stay connected. Tell us a little bit about who are the people you primarily help in your law practice? I help professionals in the DMV who are charged with criminal or traffic offenses to get the best possible outcome so that they 
can keep their driver's licenses and stay out of jail, basically, um, because people people don't realize how quickly some traffic issues or what they consider to be a minor issue could snowball and turn into a criminal issue or result in them losing their driver's license. And you know how it is in this area. If you can't drive, I mean, Ugh, it's, forget it's, it. You can't, can't get to work. You can't run errands. And, the, and you mentioned the driver's license earlier in the freedom. You don't realize it's and it's a privilege. It's 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 a privilege, not a right. So you don't realize all these, you know, you take for granted that you can just get in your car and drive anywhere. But if you lose your license for whatever reason, and there are a variety of reasons, then you lose that. Mm -hmm. So the people that I represent are um, mostly uh, professionals, early to mid career in the DMV uh, who have government jobs, um, work for contractors, people that can't lose their clearance or can't lose their license. Well, let's talk about that for a moment because you wrote this great book that I'll put I'll put a link to it in the show notes. You can find it on Amazon. It's called More Than a Fine, The True Cost of Speeding in Virginia. What are some of the things that people don't realize that a speeding ticket can do in terms of their, their record, their life, things like that, that, that you have found through your work? The first thing is that if you prepay a ticket online, now you can only prepay tickets, you cannot prepay any criminal charge. If you prepay that ticket online, you are admitting guilt, and that's literally in the Virginia Code. You are admitting guilt. Um, you also have to pay court costs, even if you don't go to court. And the DMV will assess points to your record based on what that charge is, and you cannot fight it. If you are charged with speeding at X speed and you pay that, the DMV is going to give you the points. And for people with uh, a lead foot, those things can quickly add up. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize unless they've been through it is that if you um, get a certain number of, of their demerit points is what the DMV calls them. If you get points on your license, on your driving record, your license could be will be suspended. The DMV will suspend you. It has nothing to do with the court. Um, so if you get so many points, you'll get suspended. And if you're caught driving on a suspended license, that's a crime. And people do go to jail for that. The courts surprisingly take that one really seriously um, because th the way they view it is you're flagrantly um, disobeying a court order not to drive. Mm -hmm. Another thing that people don't think about is that it can affect your ability to get life insurance. Life insurance companies look at your driving record. I did not realize this until fairly recently. They look at your driving record. They look at so many things you don't think about. Do you do you participate in, um, uh, I call them dangerous sports, but I don't know what they're really called, you know, skydiving, things like right. that. There's all sorts of things they look at, but they look at your driving record. And even if you've had no criminal convictions, they view you as, as a risk to insure because you are a risky driver and you're more likely to cause an accident and potentially die. And they would have to pay out. They look at it as a numbers game. So if your record, if your driving record is bad enough, um, they could refuse to insure you. Now, I think that's unlikely. It would probably be that in combination with some other things, but it, it will affect your rates. So you might have a, a life insurance rate that's higher purely because of your driving record. Same thing with criminal too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, DUIs and, and they look, you know, felonies, drugs, they look at certain things more so than others. But life insurance companies look at that, and most people don't know that. Um, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Yeah. And if you already have life insurance, you're probably good unless you're trying to change companies or get better rates. But when you're actually applying, um, it will affect your rates. And um, I've talked to some people who deal with life insurance. So you can, if, if you're lucky enough to get it, they could, they will insure you. And then, you know, a few years down the road, maybe you can try to get better rates if you've gone, you know, decent amount of time without any more tickets or criminal issues or anything like that. You I mean, I could keep going. There are a lot. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no. We're, we're going to get to more of those two. Like, so, so you mentioned this earlier and I want to clarify. So in the DMV, if you get a speeding ticket, that kind of violation, do you automatically have to go to court for that? You don't have to go to court. You can mm. choose to. So you can prepay the ticket or you can go to court to fight it, or you can hire a lawyer to fight it for you. Okay. But um, if you just pay it online, you're you're being convicted of what you were charged with. If you go to court to fight it, you have a chance of getting it reduced to something else or completely dropped, but you don't have any chance if you just pay it online. All right. So 
obviously a podcast, you can't see it. I'm going to do the air quotes here, right? So funny story in air quotes. I'm leaving work one day and I am on my way to a doctor's appointment. The lesson learned is it's not a smart move to speed around the Pentagon. <laughs> Let's say no. <laughs> right. So, so, so I was, and, uh, and I saw the motorcycle cop behind me and everything. And I pulled over and everything and he comes up and, you know, I get the license and registration. And he says to me, can you tell me how fast, you know, you were going? And I looked at him and I go, honestly, no. I go, obviously I was speeding because I, you pulled me over. And I go, and I know this is really cliche, but I had a really bad day at work and, and just, you don't need to hear that, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. And so I got the ticket and, you know, and was told that I had to go to court. So I go to court and here was the thing I took away from that whole experience. This isn't something you just brush off. There are, there are serious penalties and consequences that get involved in all of these things. And so, you know, the lesson learned is you don't speed on the way to a driver's license, a a doctor's appointment rather, and you leave stuff at work as best as possible and not take that with you behind the wheel. And I'm curious to like to just learn a little bit more from you. Like, what are some of the other things that people are often surprised about that they don't realize that speeding can negatively impact them? Well, another thing is juveniles, anybody who's under the Mm -hmm. age of 18 who gets a speeding ticket or any ticket resulting in demerit points, the first conviction for that, the first conviction for any offense resulting in points, um, will the DMV will require them to take a driver improvement class. And if they don't do that within 90 days, they are suspended. Now, maybe the 90 days in COVID might be relaxed, but generally that's that's what the rule is. Two convictions for offenses resulting in points, the juvenile's license is suspended. Three convictions, mm. it's revoked until they're 18 or for at least a year. So the consequences to juveniles are much more severe. The penalties are the same in terms of the law, but in terms of what the DMV does, they get suspended really quickly. And, uh, and then who, and then who really suffers because of that? The parents yeah. the parents have to drive them around. Um, they, oh, and, um, the, they can, you can get a restricted driver's license if you were suspended, but again, juveniles, it's even more restricted. Adults complain about how restrictive it is, but for juveniles, they can only go to work and school. That's it. Can't go anywhere else. Adults, you can go to doctor's appointments. You can pick up kids. Um, there's, there's a lot more places that you can go. Um, but that, that's one thing. And another thing, actually, for any parents that are listening, any juvenile that is charged with a traffic or criminal offense, a, a parent has to be involved. So if a, if a juvenile is going to prepay the ticket, there has to be a notarized signature from the parent indicating that they knew about it. And mm. if they go to court, then a parent has to go. Uh, has to. And if they don't... Basically, the court will subpoena you, <laughs> so you have to go. And if you don't go, that could be a contempt of court charge. So if your kid gets in trouble, <laughs> you're going to court too. Did not know that either. Interesting. Yeah. Gene, where do you find your clients? <laughs> um, mostly or do they find you? <laughs> well, yeah, they, I guess they eventually find me. Um, <laughs> but mostly referrals from colleagues, referrals from other attorneys, and um, and then from people just finding me online and, and social media and things like that. How important has social media been for you in terms of growing your business? I would say it has, it has been um, integral, mm-hmm. even more so after COVID hit. I always worked on my own social media. I started my business in 2014. Mm-hmm. I always worked on my own social media and I tried to be active, but I definitely was much more active starting, you know, about a year ago once COVID hit. Um, and actually funny story. Well, it's not funny. (laughs) Um, I got really sick in March of last year. And I remember it was the day the national emergency was declared Friday, the 13th that just stuck out in my head. Um, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't breathe. My husband called the, um, uh, Fairfax, um, 
Fairfax Hospital emergency room. They wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't let me in. So we went to an urgent care. Nobody was wearing masks. At that time, I didn't care. I mean, it, things developed so quickly. But you didn't it, know, yeah. Yeah, at that time, I was like, yeah, let's stay away from people. And um, got prescriptions, didn't get better, went back on Monday. Went Going back on Monday of that next week, everybody like was dressed up like stormtroopers. Every inch of their body was covered. They wouldn't let my husband into the urgent care. Um, but, um, but anyway, so I was, and I don't get sick or if I do, I'm out for like a day and I was sick for two weeks, Mm. two weeks. So my point of this story is I was about two weeks behind the zoom bandwagon. I saw on social that everybody was having these zoom meetings that companies and organizations were starting to go to zoom, but I was, I was sick. I was like, I'm not going to put on my makeup. I don't care. I don't want to. And then once I started to feel better, I'm like, what am I going to do? I have to stay in front of people because I used to go to networking events all the time. I thought, you know, people are going to forget about me. What am I going to do? So started, you know, going to everything on Zoom. And that's how I met John. John did a presentation at the Central Fairfax Chamber. That was one of the first things that I did. And then I I reached out to John. Um, But I started doing Facebook Lives. Um, I just started getting, you know, because I was at home and I still had work and clients coming in, but it was really important to me to like stay in front of people. So I I did spend a lot of time on social media and it actually um, has worked. I've gotten more exposure. I've made friends and um, professional, uh, professional relationships with people that I've never even met in person. John and I have not met in person. No, that's Uh, right. We haven't. No, we, we mentioned a year ago that we were going to get coffee and we still haven't. (laughs) That's right. Oh my gosh. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. But, um, but, and and it's been successful. I've, I've had more exposure. I've had more opportunities to attend more things because you know how traffic is in this area. Sometimes it's just impossible for me, you know, getting from court in Manassas to something in Fairfax, you know, midday or, Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to do a lot more things and it, it has been very successful. Um, like so successful to the point that, um, I need to, uh, I need to streamline, (laughs) I need to streamline things because, you know, you can't, you can't be everywhere, even virtually. Um, but a long answer to your question, (laughs) um, it's, it's been very successful and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that I did start start doing what I did because I, I wouldn't have met you otherwise, you know, I met a lot of great people and, um, and I've, I've gotten a lot of business from it too. Yeah. That's great to hear. And one of the things that in leading up to today's conversation that you had referenced, and I, I want to put a spotlight on this because I have seen this be such a common occurrence for a lot of mid-career professionals whether they are business owners or they're working in whatever organization or business they're in is this whole idea around delegating. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who owns their own business is very driven, very hyper-focused, what's been the biggest lesson that you are learning right now around what delegating looks like in your career? I have been working on this for prob for a while, but probably about a year and a half ever since I had my first assistant. What I'm learning about delegating, is, and I'm looking at my planner right now. Um, what? And I, I think it's a constant learning process. What do I absolutely have to do? What could somebody else do for me? And out of those things that somebody else could do, should I let somebody else do them? Um, and it's hard. It, it it's hard to to delegate and and to trust people because the, whatever they do is going to reflect on your business, whatever your business is. But and and it's it's been it's been a struggle. Um, but I I have recognized that at the time when I hired my first assistant, I had plateaued because I was so busy with work. And this was pre COVID. I could not. I knew that I couldn't take on another client, and that's a problem. Mm-hmm. I, I knew I literally like, just, I, I don't have any more time. So I had to have somebody come in to do some administrative things. And I've been working on a manual and I revise that every once in a while as questions come up. Cause I tried, I tried to be really clear in that, but you know, when I run my business one way, you run it a completely different way. Everybody has their own different systems. Um, 
So what I'm learning about delegating is, again, a long answer to your question, figuring out what to delegate. What do I absolutely have to do? And what can you give to other people or other businesses? Like I used to do my taxes myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I sound like a weirdo, but I kind of like doing it. But okay. I don't I don't have time anymore. I just, I don't. Like I will, I will pay somebody. I'm a, and that's another thing. You think you don't have money. You think, oh, I'll save the money. I'll do it myself. I'll do this myself. I'll do that myself. That, you can't do that. You will eventually get to the point in your business where you have to spend money on things because you cannot do it all. And I think that when people get to that point, it might be a little too late. And I don't know how you can recognize that beforehand, but I recognized when I had plateaued that I needed help and I probably should have gotten the help earlier. So that's one piece of advice that I'd give to people. Um, I, I can't, I can't say something specific to look for, but you, you probably know, like you are getting, you're getting so busy that you need help and mm-hmm. investing, whatever it is, if it's a virtual assistant, if it's a, you know, a virtual receptionist, whatever it is for you, um, that you have to, you have to just bite the bullet and, and do it. And, and I, and I, I've, I've, uh, I've tried some things that didn't work and, uh, yeah, I mean, you could say it was a waste of money, but I, I learned some lessons, but I tried it because I needed to. Um, and then you you always learn from those things, you know, what what you don't want from a company or what, what you don't want from an assistant. So Absolutely. you have to try also. You can't be afraid to to try. Otherwise, you're never going to grow. Without a doubt. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, these are the kind of things where... It, it's you you feel like I have to do this myself. I have to do this myself. And then you take a really hard look at that to-do list and you go, no, someone else could do that. Or I have the resources to have somebody else do that. And then it's really kind of a, a nice part in the business when you're able to pay somebody to do work for you because you're helping them out. They're helping you out. It's a nice, a nice situation in that. But these are the lessons we learn as business owners, right? Mm-hmm. These are the lessons we learn especially as solopreneurs starting out and figuring out when it comes time to scale, what's the next, the next thing in that. So I really appreciate you sharing that. So Gene, as we start wrapping up here today, and it always strikes me that the, these conversations go by so quickly, right? Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give someone who is trying to figure out what's next in their career as they're as they're navigating what may seem like detours in their careers or or stops if you will as they're building their gps what would you recommend for them in terms of navigating toward whatever is next on their mid career journey i would actually suggest a few things one networking. And I'm surprised I didn't mention this earlier. Networking has been extremely helpful for me. I started networking when I worked on the Hill because you don't network when you need a job, you network or an opportunity, you network before so that you have a network of people that you can contact, whether it's for a job or advice or whatever the situation is. I think networking is crucial and do it before you need it. Um, And as a lot of people say, networking is work. It's, you have to, you have to put time, you have to put effort, you got to follow up with people. Um, Something else that I would suggest, and this might sound a little silly, but I would say, you know, listen to, to your intuition because my intuition has told me, you know, not to take a job. I took it. I was miserable. Hmm. Um, And it was, it's hard to turn down money. Um, And, and then eventually I just got so tired of it. I, I, I just, I left, I left for, for less money because it, it wasn't about the money. So for me, everything was kind of culminating at one point. I was graduating, finishing my master's, um, work was just getting more and more miserable. And I took proactive steps too. I did. Um, I, I consider myself an extroverted person. Um, and, um, I, what's the word I used to describe myself? Um, uh, assertive, not aggressive. Okay. Um, I, I reached out to, uh, you could call me aggressive, I don't know. I reached out to a bunch of attorneys that I had talked to over the years about potential jobs. Uh, and they all got back to me. And one of them made me an offer. Um, and if I didn't reach out, I never would have had that opportunity. And that opportunity um, resulted in in me starting my own firm. 
So I guess to sum up, um, I would say networking um, and listening to your intuition, because I, like you and your job, I, I could not have retired from there. I would have been miserable my whole life. And, and not being afraid to go for what you want, because the worst thing that can happen is someone says no. And yeah, what's yeah. so bad about that? Okay. You keep trying. Yeah. Give us your best networking tip. Ooh. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> um, being genuine, mm. not being phony, because over the years I've done a lot of networking. Oh, and not being salesy. I guess that's all genuine. Right. If I, can, yep. if I can tell that someone's just trying to sell me on something, I immediately lose interest. So just be genuine, be yourself and, you know, and be interested. If you don't want to go somewhere and you're only go virtually or in person, if you're only going because you should, people are going to notice that. So, and there's so many networking opportunities in this area, you know, find something that you enjoy that you want to go to and mm-hmm. be yourself. Yeah. Well, Jean, I thank you for spending some time with me today and sharing your story. And before we go, I'd love for you to share with my listeners how people can get in contact with you, find your book, all those kind of great things. So please share with us. My book is available on Amazon and um, there are a variety of ways you can find me. Jean at humbrecklaw.com is my email. And um, all my social handles are pretty much the same. Um, Twitter.com slash Humbrecht Law, LinkedIn.com slash Humbrecht Law, or Gene Humbrecht, Facebook.com slash Humbrecht Law. And I also have a YouTube channel where all of my videos reside. Um, and I can put the uh, link to that in the show notes. But again, it's Humbrecht Law. So yep. <laughs> pull it, put in Humbrecht Law and you'll find me somewhere. And I, and I love that you are not only just active on social media, but you are consistent on social media. So we, we get to see those, those regular Facebook lives and those posts and things that you do. So I certainly hope people will reach out and connect with you. And especially if you're in the DMV and you are looking for an attorney to help you, especially if you do have a traffic violation, definitely uh, contact Jean and I know she'll be a great resource and help for you. So Jean, my friend, thank you so much. It's been great spending some time with you today. Thank you, John. Yeah, we need to talk more often. <laughs> we, we do. And and eventually you and I will grab that cup of coffee in person. I promise. We will. We will. Well, I'll update you all in 2022 if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Everybody take care, be well, stay safe. And I will see you soon with another great episode. Make it a great day. If you enjoyed today's show and don't want to miss an episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you usually listen. If you haven't already, I'd appreciate it if you would leave me a rating and review to let me know what you think to help others find this podcast and continue to bring you relevant and useful content to help you navigate what's next for your career. And if you're ready to create your mid-career GPS and get rid of the overwhelm so you can find the job you'll love or love the job you have, visit my website at johnnarrell.com for more information about joining my private Facebook group and scheduling a free consult with me so we can start building your mid-career GPS together. Don't forget to connect with me on LinkedIn Follow me on social at John Narrow Coaching. I'll see you next time.